Yes, so uh, there is a sound uh, which is playing but very, very quietly, so quietly you can't hear it. Uh, it's the four song. And uh, originally this was called um, Everything You Wanted to Know About Four and More. Uh, we did this talk, Josh Surat and I wrote this together and delivered it at Scala World and the title was deemed too boring, so we had a competition. And the winner was four, what is it good for? Absolute T nothing. Say it again. So um, sadly, Josh is not able to join me today. Uh, it's a lot of fun uh, working with and presenting with Josh, but he uh, has uh, a lot of stuff going on and couldn't make it. So it's just me. I apologize if you were expecting the, the dual act. Hopefully, I can pull this off myself. I may at times take Josh's part uh, for comic relief, but uh, we'll see how that goes. My name's Dick Wall. Um, I decided having one job was too easy, so ended up getting two of them. Uh, in, my, in my professional life, um, I do Scala training uh, with Escalate Soft, and if you like what you see today, bear us in mind for Scala training. And then uh, um, my day job is with a company called Sibo Technologies. We are hiring. Uh, they asked me to say that. Oh, we do very interesting work, the kind of thing you're going to be seeing today. So um, hopefully, uh, yeah. All right. Have I got... There we go. Okay. So, four. What is it good for? Um, four is a very interesting uh, and sophisticated and powerful and flexible language construct in Scala. Uh, and when I mention, I don't know how, it would, Josh and I talk probably once a week at the, at, the very, at the very least, and we're always riffing on stuff, and we sort of came across this one together. It was, it was like, you know, there's a bunch of things that I, I show my coworkers that they can do in four, and they're completely blown away by that. And he said, I've noticed the same thing. We should do a talk on that. So this was a bit of an experiment. And one of the things that's different with this talk compared with a lot of the other ones that we've both done in the past is uh, normally a talk has a level, like it's beginner, intermediate, advanced. This one is a super narrow vertical thing. It's about four. And it will run from the very basic principles all the way through to monad transformers and then some co-monads at the end. So I think there will be something for everybody. If you get a bit lost along the way, don't panic. Um, not, you're not, you, not going to be tested on this at the end or anything. This is just hopefully some, uh, everybody will get something to take away from this. I'm particularly pleased that when we did this at Scala World, uh, Miles Sabin came up and said afterwards, I learned something in your talk. And I, th I figured job done at that point. Apparently, everybody took something away that they didn't know. What he learned was mostly useless, but, um, you know. <laughs> uh, well, I thought it was. He got very excited about it, so that's, that's good. Okay, so people arrive. Uh, imagine the scene. People arrive at Scala for the first time, and they see four. They see this keyword, four, and they're like, I know what that does. I know exactly what that does. Believe me, I, I train a lot of people. I see this, this pattern all the time. They think... Four, it's about looping. I can do things like this, right? So I can go for i from 1 to 10, print line hello world, and I get 10 hello worlds. Clearly, that's about, that's about looping. And then they, you, know, you, can, you can use the i. If you're not using the index, you can use the ubiquitous uh, Scala underscore, uh, which means I don't really care what this thing is, just match anything, right? So uh, you can do this. Uh, some people haven't seen that notation before, but it just means... I'm going from 1 to 10, but I don't really care about that value. So, you know, make it happen. Don't give me the value. You can do more than one thing by putting things in curly, uh, curly brackets here. Um, uh, so I suppose it's worth going into. I don't have a lot of time, not as much as I normally do. But main difference, um, curly brackets and parentheses, in case you didn't know in Scala, are, are often interchangeable. The main difference between them is you can have commas inside uh, parens and you, can, you get semicolon inference inside of uh, curly brackets. That's a good way to remember it. So often you'll see curly brackets around the second block in a four. You can also have it around the first block in a four, and you'll get semicolon inference if you do that. What's actually going on when you do this is, if I run that, we'll see uh, a bunch of stuff coming up. Uh, what you're getting here is you're getting one to 10 turns into a sequence called a range. Uh, it's actually a lazy sequence in Scala. I feel like that's too low. Hopefully that's better. Um, and what the four is doing is visiting each of those items in turn and doing something with it. Right? If you put two of them together, well let's do this again, you can see the same thing by doing one to ten dot four each. 
And in fact, you know, lesson number one may be a bit basic. This is literally the same code. Okay, I'm going to show you that in a second. But when Scala sees a for expression, it dis it it desugars it into calls to for each map, flat map, with filter, and val. Uh, effectively, this is what happens. The Scala compiler does this, and I'll I'll prove that to you in a second. So this is literally equivalent code. The the code above, by the time it gets through parsing, the parsing stage of the compiler will actually look something like this. It'll actually look a bit uglier than that because there'll be some dollar signs in there and other stuff that Scala likes to, to jump in with. Now, what about something like this? So this is a bit more interesting. We've got uh, for i from 1 to 5 and from j from 1 to 5, for j from 1 to 5, in the same block. What's that going to look like? Well, desugared, this comes out to look like this. 1 to 5 for each i, 1 to 5 for each j, and then print line that number of times. OK, so I'm not going to labor this a whole lot. Just I think it's interesting so far. Um, I can't remember what that one at the end was for, but I'm not going to spend time on it because I think we can move on uh, quicker. OK, so what we've seen so far is a for statement. Uh, it is a statement because it has no useful return type. OK, in order for that, in order for this stuff, uh, where is it? Ah. No, don't, don't die. In order for this to do anything useful, it has to have some kind of side effect in the, in the block. Otherwise, you, it's going to heat up your CPU, and that's about all it's going to do. There won't be any observable, any observable change from it. And that's because it returns unit in Scala, which is equivalent to void. It means it has no, no interesting return type. It's just not, it, it's giving you nothing back. So, pretty quickly, people realize that that's, that's poor style in a functional language, and they discover what they call the yielding way. Uh, how many people are actually old enough to understand this reference in the room? Okay, there's a few. Uh, June, there, there's a novel called June, and there's a thing called the weirding way in June. Uh, there's a lot of puns in this, because Josh and I, when you put us together, it's like some kind of um, critical mass of puns. Uh, they just seem to build and eventually explode. So a yield looks very much like a for, uh, a for statement, except now it becomes an expression. You now have the for, and you have a yield keyword. Suddenly, this thing is functional in nature. It returns stuff instead. Uh, it is much, much more useful and, uh, and much more functional as a result. So we can do something like this. Instead of printing out the squares now, we can actually yield them. And what we'll get back is a vector in this case. It's actually an index seek, but a vector of 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, blah, blah, blah. I think this is worth a quick mention. Um, because of the way the Scala collections are written, 4 and the desugaring that, uh, that happens to 4 behind the scenes, when you start with a particular kind of collection, it will attempt to give you that same collection back again. If I started this with a list, and I did a 4 and a yield, I should get a list back again, OK? If I started it with a vector, I should get a vector back again. I started it with a range, and a range is a little bit more unusual in that it is an arithmetic progression. It actually, uh, behind the scenes, it isn't materialized. It just says, I start at 1, and then I add 1 to it, and then I add 1 to that, and so on. So that is actually something that then cannot represent uh, a square for example. Uh, it, I suppose it could if you really wanted to get into uh, you know, some, some mathematics there. But Scala gives up on that. So what it does instead is it goes back up the call hierarchy and finds the least upper bounds of a type that is suitable for what it needs to give back, which in this case is a vector. So it actually says, I'm starting with a range. I'm ending with a vector. I'm going to give you back an indexed seek, because an indexed seek is the superclass to both um, uh, range and vector. OK, but usually it'll give you back what you started with. You can do some other things like this. A uh, useful thing to do is to know that there's a two map. So if we yield i uh, and then two, the, the arrow which creates a tuple to the square, I get, I get back then a map of the squares and so on. So far, you're probably thinking, gosh, I really wish I hadn't come to this. This is all so basic, and I'm learning absolutely nothing. So I'm going to kick it up a notch at this point. This turns into 
Uh, have I got them down here, or is it on the next? Probably on the next thing. Uh, let's just show you anyway. What this turns into behind the scenes is, where did my windows go? Ooh, some really cool stuff. So, we saw that four turns into four each, right? When you use a four yield block, you get a map. But you actually get a map for the first thing. Uh, when we do something, let me show you the, uh, let me show you the, oh, my yield notebook, bring back my yield notebook. There we go. When we do something like this, the first thing there actually becomes what we call a flat map, and the second thing becomes a map, and that is because if we were to run this otherwise, if it was to do map everywhere, uh, you can work this out for yourself later, you would actually end up with a sequence of sequence of things, right? The, it, would, it would map over the first one, you get a sequence, but it would map over the second one, you get an, another sequence which gets embedded in that. So we have this thing called flat map that is meant to stop that happening, to, to prevent that, that uh, uh, explosion of nested, nested things. And the rules are actually very simple. Uh, all of these dereference arrows in the four, uh, in the, in the four block get turned into flat map, except from the last one, which gets turned into map. Okay, that's kind of how it does it. It does flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map, map. And I want to show you that, so, so you'll believe me. So, uh, this might be the first uh, time some of you have seen this. In Scala, uh, let me show you this. Show phases. Anybody done this before? Seen this? This is how the Scala compiler works. Um, what actually happens is there are a number of phases, 25 right now, uh, and what, what happens is the Scala compiler starts off as all compilers do by tokenizing and parsing the code, but then it ejects something called an abstract syntax tree, and that abstract syntax tree, uh, gosh, real inside baseball here, is actually uh, what we call an algebraic data type. It's a bunch of case classes, and the Scala compiler is effectively a great big pattern matcher. It gets these case classes that represent the, the program that you've written. And each phase, up until the very last one, which generates JVM bytecode, works on those patterns and changes the patterns. It morphs them as it moves through the Scala compiler. This is interesting because this parser is where a lot of interesting or you know, early processing happens in the Scala compiler. And one of the things it does, as it says here, is once it's turned the source into an abstract syntax tree, it performs simple desugaring. Now we can actually stop the compiler at any point along its way and print out what the abstract syntax tree looks like. You can do that like this. So if I look at for expansion one dot Scala, okay, this is a simple for expansion of i from one to three, j from one to three, k from one to three, yield i times j times k. Let's compile that, dash x, and we're going to do print parser. So stop at after the parser stage and print out what you've got for expansion one dot Scala. Okay. Whoa, that was slow. Okay, so the line I want you to look at is the one that says malts here, and uh, you'll see that I wasn't lying to you. It now says one to three flat map i goes to one to three flat map j, goes to one to three flat map, or oh, one to three map k, and then it calculates the result, okay? That's the desugaring that takes place. This happens to all four expressions in Scala. Okay, so no, don't uh, cancel, cancel. I've apparently opened up too many things. Leave. Okay, so that's yielding. So. This is the next progression people go through. Uh, so we've shown you how this thing desugars. People say, well, four is obviously about looping because that's what they've come to it from. And it, this is somewhat of a shame that four was chosen for this because four carries so much baggage from other languages. Uh, Haskell has a similar construct to this called do. Uh, do also gets associated with looping a lot of the time, um, uh, you know, as it, as it happens. But what I'll tell you right now is for, neither for nor do are actually about looping. Uh, do in Haskell, not do in Scala. Do in Scala is actually about looping. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. Sorry if that was uh, coming at you a bit quick. But what I will tell you is for, the for expression in Scala, 
its relationship to looping is incidental. It's on, it only appears to be looping because of the type of thing that it's working on, okay? We can show you an example of this, an option, okay? Uh, options are this kind of box that can either have something in it or doesn't have something in it. And lo and behold, option, amongst the things that it has, it has a for each, it has a map, and it has a flat map on it. This means we can use it in a for expression. And when we do, people say, oh, well, it's just another collection. It's like a collection, but it's got like at most one things in it. So I see people wrestle with that concept. So here's an example. Um, and I want to show you this as well, because this is a nice pattern that I want you to remember after this. Here is something that just multiplies three numbers together. Shouldn't be any surprise there. If I turn those all into options, OK, here's the original, x, y, z, result is x times y times z. If I turn all these into options, all I have to do to make it work now in that space is dereference x, y, and z in a for expression, OK, and then take the same piece of code that I wanted to run on x, y, and z and move it into the yield. That formula will work on any kind of container that works with for. You can just dereference things, move, them into, move that into the yield block. This is true for futures. This is true for any of the monads you'll deal with. Just take that code, dereference the things, use the same code that you were using, but use it in a yield block. Nice, easy formula for people to remember. And lo and behold, if we run this, we will see, oh, and the, the first one I should run first. So this one gives you back, uh, when it finally runs, uh, gives you back sum of six. Now, what's interesting here is that we can write this code now, assuming the happy case. This is another advantage to these things. And so we can say x times y times z, or z. And if one of them is not an expected value, let's say we have none, for example, the container itself knows how to deal with that situation. It does this. We could go into this, but we don't have time. It does this through its definition of what map and flat map are. Okay? As you go through a map or a flat map operation with a none, you always end up with a none. So therefore, the whole thing becomes a none. They're defined like that. Uh, there's no magic there. It's just that it lets you concentrate on the happy case and takes care of the sad cases for you. So people say, when they first see that, they're like, oh, that's option. It's just like another. It's just like another collection. You're cheating me. And then we show them that it works on futures. So same example. Uh, but this time, we're going to bring in, let's get these running here. And we'll do a future one. So this is cool. We'll do the future. And we will show when it runs. There we go. At first, it will tell us the, uh, the future, the value of future is none. That's because it hasn't actually been resolved yet. I've made it sleep for 10 seconds. Um, Victor Klang will kill a puppy every time somebody puts a sleep in the code. So don't, don't do this at home. <laughs> I got special Victor permission to do this. Um, but if I wait the requisite amount of time, I get the answer out again. Now, that all happened in a future. A future is definitely not any kind of collection, right? It's a deferred operation. It's a deferred execution. It's happening. It's, it's a promise of something that's going to happen later. So it, once again, it just works. And it's the same formula. We just took the, the thing that would have been written outside of this. We do reference the futures now. We did, oops, sorry. We did the same thing in the yield block. But now we have non-blocking asynchronous code. That's the beauty of this. That container did all this clever stuff behind the scenes and made it so that this thing it returns immediately whether it's done or not yet. And the whole thing becomes asynchronous. It's very powerful to be able to do this. So then you say, well, clearly, fours are not about loops. And that's the place where you finally reach four creamy enlightenment. And uh, the, the whole world suddenly shifts about an axis. You're like, wow, this thing's really cool. So the philosophy of a four is basically work on what's inside and let the outside take care of itself. Okay, you're, con you're actually splitting concerns. You're letting a container dictate how it's going to work, be it deferred execution or a try is another example of this, where it could be exceptions. It knows how to pass the exceptions forward if that's, if that's the state it's in. 
What's my happy case? The sad case is, de is decided by the container, and the logic matters, but the context does not matter. At least not yet. OK, now we get into the pun section of our talk. Uh, this, is, this is all on Josh. I had, no, I had no hand in this. He decided that if we could have the three R's of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, of which there's actually only one of those that starts with an R, he decided we could do the same thing with fours for a G. So we actually do a bit better, but we have what we call the, the, the three Gs, or actually the four Gs of a four, okay? There, there is the four block, which is the setup for your, uh, for your four expression. It has three things that it can do. It can have a generator, which is the arrow. That means take something from inside of something else and use it. It can have a guard, which is an if, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. And it can have an inline assignment, okay, <laughs> with a G. The G may be silent, but it's still there. And the inline assignment is somewhat like a vowel. It lets you put something into the four, uh, the four setup. And then finally, the yield or give block, because that starts with a G, gives you back the, the payoff to this setup, okay? All right, generators. Um, some things you might not know about generators. Generators are pattern matches. Uh, there's another place where pattern matches show up in Scala. Let me show you one of those. A lot of people are surprised about this. Uh, case, class, person, name, string, whoops, string, age, int. And if I say val p1 equals Harry uh, person, Harry Potter, and here's a scary thought. I think he would be 32 now, <laughs> uh, judging from when the first book was written. So P1, Harry Potter. And now I can say val uh, person of name and age equals P1. That's a pattern match in Scala. Okay, a lot of people don't know that, that val is actually a pattern match. So is the left-hand side of a, four ex uh, of a four expressions generator block. So you can do things like this, uh, wrong window. You can do things like, from a map, key comma value. A map behaves like a, effectively a sequence of tuples. So we can unpack the key and value from the tuple two right there in the code. Very nice idiomatic way of iterating over the keys and values in a map right there. Lots of things that you can do with that. Um, and I mentioned that it's consistently typed, so I'm not going to not going to harp on that. But basically, if you start with a list, you should you most times will end up with a list. If you start with an option, you end up with an option. If you start with a future, you end up with a future. Now, here's a rule: you can't mix the things in a setup block. Okay, and we're going to hit that in a minute. That's that's how do you how would you mix uh, an option and a future? Now, if you now that you know how it desugars. Try writing that as a set of maps and flat maps sometimes, and you'll see the problem. The type signatures don't match up. It violates the type signatures of map and flat map if you try and mix uh, a list and a future, or an option and a future, or something like that. OK, one last thing we're going to look at is guards. Uh, oh, no, that's actually in, uh, in line assignments as well. Guards are a way of saying, you know that backup plan that this container has when something goes wrong? In other words, it's a none, or the future has failed, or the try is an exception. The guard will short circuit to that state. Okay, so we can basically say, you know, for x from 1 to 10, for y from 1 to 10, this is a, um, this is a range or a loop based operation. If x mod 4 is less than y mod 5. What this turns into behind the scenes is one more uh, special name that it uses, which is with filter. It calls something called with filter. You can, it's called with filter as an optimization. You can actually implement with filter pretty easily in terms of filter if you ever write one of these yourself. It's not, it's not that hard to do. Uh, but you can also use the with filter to optimize things and do things lazily if you prefer to do that, which is uh, one of the reasons it's there. And then an inline assignment. So at any point in the code, uh, let's bring up the, um, the examples for this, because I think they're a bit more descriptive. Uh, here's a guard. So for i from 1 to 10, for j from 1 to 10, if i mod 3 equals equals 0, or j mod 3 equals equals 0, k from 1 to 10, and so on. Now, if we down here 
decided we wanted to check the, multi the multiple, one of the things we can do is we can say if i times j times k mod 2 equals equals z 0, then yield i times j times k. But this means we have to do that, that uh, computation twice. What we can do is just an inline assignment in there. Okay, it's different from a generator. It doesn't map or flat map. It just sticks a vowel into the whole desugaring process. And this ends up looking something like this. Now, when you do this, it has to pass forward two things suddenly. It passes forward the k that we've just, uh, that we've just got here in our map, and it also passes forward the multiplier. I think Rob, uh, Rob told me there was a mistake on this slide. Uh, and it's quite possible there is. But I can show you that it does, in fact, do this pattern matching, and I will do that in a second. So that's how the thing gets passed forward. It actually gets tupled up and passed forward. And this was the thing that uh, Miles actually hadn't really thought about before. And we both, uh, in a conversation afterwards, had this sudden uh, sort of um, question that hit us both at the same time, which is, what happens if you get more than 22 of those things? So we wrote it. And it turns it into a tuple of tuples at that point. So it does cope. Um, we, f we found that out on the day. It will cope with more than 22 things in there. So some other things you can do with an inline assignment, though, and I think this is one of the gems, is remember that underscore where we don't care what something is? Well, we can use that. We can put an inline assignment, and then we can call any code we want to on the right-hand side of that, any method we want, any side-affecting stuff that we want to do. Maybe we want to print a diagnostic out like this. That's one way you can do that. Uh, put a log message in there to help with debugging. All sorts of things like that. Okay. Obviously, it's not very uh, functional to stick side effects, especially in a four in a four block. That's going to cause some weird stuff to happen unless it's just a diagnostic like this. <coughs> but it can occasionally be quite useful to be uh, uh, to be able to sort of drop in in the middle and find out. Uh, what the state of things are. So, okay. Oh, and I promised I'd show you what that looks like. So let's go back out here. I'll show you one more trick <coughs> along the way, which is using Ammonite. Anyone use Ammonite? Yeah? Okay, yes. Ammonite's got some neat features, and one of them is this. So let me go back. First of all, let's put in a fairly lengthy, uh, that was the example I did with the inline assignment. And then Ammonite includes, wow, that's slow, come on. And then Ammonite includes a nice little macro called dsugar that you can use. And you can dump the same code into dsugar, and it will stop and print out the abstract syntax tree just like the compiler does. So that, that is what that <laughs> turns into. You can see the pattern matches here. Uh, it's doing a, a case of tuple 2 of k and malt. Uh, and so you can see how that feeds forward through the process. The if becomes a with filter. But you can see, again, just desugars into those calls. So the thing about that is you can use for in your own code by supplying for each map, flat map, and with filter with the, uh, you know, with the correct signatures or even the incorrect ones. And if we have time, how am I doing? Another 20 minutes. I think we might, we might get to the... Uh, not quite. How long? That one's 10 minutes fast, though. Oh, no. oh, right. OK. Well, i got to move then. All right. So this is where I'm going to channel my very, very good friend, Josh. Things that have flat maps and maps. Um, well, a map is uh, something that lends itself to being called a functor. And a flat map, I think there's a talk on that right after that, this talk in this room. And a flat map le uh, lends itself to something called a monad. Uh, scary names for and utterly meaningless names, by the way, for something that, that needs to be done. Now, the thing is, as Josh likes to say, uh, it's a bit of a corruption to say something is a monad, uh, because the correct technical way of saying it is that something has a monad. Um, now, in Scala, that's become a bit more muddied, because flat map and map and things like that, they're actually implemented on the classes themselves. And that's how, that's how Scala's for expression uses them. But you can formalize things by actually creating a monad trait, if you want to do that. And our monad trait is going to have, it's actually a monad functor. All, all monads are functors. Uh, but we're going to have an apply, we're going to have a flat map, and we're going to have a map. And this is going to be for any type M. 
that we want to put. So we could write one of these for list, we could write one of these for option, we could write one of these for future, and once we've written that, we could use this monad in a for expression. Okay, we can formalize it like this. Now, why would you want to do this when it appears to be easier? I think maybe I've got just enough time to cover the, uh, the type signatures here. Type signature for flat map is pretty simple. Starting from some m of a and given a function that goes from a to m of b, the result will be m of b. That's the flattening part because it doesn't become m of m of b. The map is starting from m of a and given a function from a to b, we still end up with an m of b. Now that's a map, but if you combine them together, you'll see that you actually migrate through the system staying in the, in the type space of m. Everything gets passed forward as an m as it moves through. Okay, and here's an example of um, just, you know, pulled out of the air some GitHub API call that we're, that we're doing. And in this case, we're using that context, the, um, uh, a particular context, for a sequence of project of something. Now, why do we do this? Why are we doing this with context of underscore? Well, if we have a monad for context of underscore, we can actually swap in what we want to use here. So this is fairly... Um, this is fairly flexible. It also comes at a fair amount of implementation cost. Don't underestimate the amount of work to make this, uh, to make this work. But what you could do is have a synchronous and an asynchronous implementation for this that is swapped in at compile time, basically. And you can say, uh, for testing purposes, I'm going to run this using the ID monad, which is basically just return itself. Just run it, run it in the current uh, in the current thread, blocking, all of that stuff, make it easy to debug. And then when you're out in production, you can swap in a future context for it, and suddenly everything happens asynchronously. So that's a, that's a, a nice thing to be able to do. And if you want to know more about that, Josh has a great resource up on GitHub, intro to FP, that you can go and read up all about that. Other types that can have monads, um, either state, validation, many of these. I'm not going to dig into them because I want to get to the, ex uh, to the more um, exciting part. So monads don't mix. Okay, It's very, very bad. The, and, and you can see the reason for this. If we go back to here, uh, if we start with an option, pretty much the only place that we can go to is an option. And the flat map requires the same M. It has to be another option. Okay, start with a future. This type signature is only going to be satisfied by another future. This is the reason you can't mix these things. Okay, so now they're <laughs> unfortunately in their attempt to make things easier, um, uh, there is an implicit conversion from <laughs> option to sequence that allows some mixing. This is very confusing for beginners. Some cases where option can be slammed into the middle of a bunch of sequences and it still works. And then all of a sudden, you add another sequence, and it doesn't anymore. And you see it um, uh, you know, in this setup. You see it with something. Oh, I haven't, haven't run my beginner bit. There we go. Let's get that running. And once that's run, get this running. So if you write it out in the way that, we've, that I've been uh, telling you to do so, you know, in your mind, flat map, flat map, flat map, map. The problem actually exists right here uh, from the flat map of option to the flat map of seek. The problem here is not, this is not the problem, the first one, because an option can be promoted to a seek implicitly in Scala, but it doesn't happen the other way around, obviously, and a, a sequence can have more than one thing, so you can't make an option out of a sequence implicitly. And so what happens is when you get to this point here, it says you're trying to map, flat map a seek into something that's expecting an option. There's no implicit for that, so that's a type error. Okay, how do you get around this? Quick answer is stick to seek on all of your options when you do this. Whether it needs it or not, just go ahead and do it. It makes it much easier than having to think about it. Okay, that's the, that's the quick fix there. All right, so what happens when, mon when monads don't mix? Well, sometimes you want to cross the streams, right? Sometimes you're dealing with a a future and something else gives you back an option and maybe you get a list from somewhere else and now you're like, damn, I really want all these things to work together somehow. How am I going to get this to work? 
All right. So, <laughs> in the grand tradition of Scala over engineering, um, I'm going to talk about that solution first, and then talk about the sensible ways to tackle it. Actually, I'm being unfair. This is a this is a lovely library that Daniel Spiewak wrote. I think it's actually, if I was ever going to use these, um, this would be what I do. Uh, I can tell you now, in 10 years of Scala development, I still haven't ever had to use a mono transformer. There has never not been another option. I'm sure there are people in this room that would disagree with me, but they're usually doing type astronauty stuff that I don't do in my day-to-day -day work. However, this is, as they go, probably one of the best solutions to this. Okay, It's called M, and it is a uh, macro-based very generic solution to this problem of monad transformers. And you can, it, it really does illustrate the kind of idea of what it's trying to do. So the idea with a monad transformer is you have some monads that are different. You can't mix them together. So you have this thing called a monad transformer, and it exists to provide a common uh, grouping for all of these different monads so that they will work together. And the way it does that is you specify, well, I'm dealing with a future and an option in this case. So I'm going to set up a monad transformer that's future, option, and then the last thing always has to be base. It's like nil at the end of a list. So it's the future of an option of something. When you do this, you get an implicit lift M that will take any of the types here, anywhere along here, and turn them into one of these M's, or one of these E's in this case. So we can lift an option into a future option. We can lift a future into a future option. And we can run the result. And what we'll get back eventually is a future of option, no matter whether we started with an option in there or a future in there or whatever. You can mix them together at that point. And it just basically uses the fact that monads follow a bunch of laws if they're going to be well behaved. The fact that they're following those laws makes this kind of uh, generalization possible. Uh, I think I've got time to show this very quickly. Now, you know what? I'm not going to show it because I really don't have time. I'm going to show you an alternative instead. Uh, back when I was a kid, um, my dad used to have everybody's, everybody's dad's their hero, right? And uh, you're in the garage and he's working three minutes. He's working on uh, power tools and I'm like, Dad, I want to use the drill. And he's like, he hands me this one. I says, why don't you get used to that one before you use the other one? And, uh, you know, as, as I've grown up, I have one of these now. I have my own power drill. I also still have a hand drill. And occasionally it's faster and easier to use. And you really get an appreciation of the materials you're working on and so on and so forth. You don't always need a cannon to kill, to kill a mosquito. So what are some of the other things you can do? Well, a lot of people don't know you can do this. Okay, here's the problem. My... Uh, imports here, I'm, instead of all futures or all options, I've got a future, option, and future. Can I do this? No, I cannot do that. It's, they're mixing. It says, you've got a, I found a future, I required an option. I can't mix those things together. One of the things I can do is this. Did you know you can have a four inside of a four? A lot of people don't know that. Sure you can. Why wouldn't you? So x from f1, or from the future, z from f3, and res equals inline assignment to get the last one for y from o2. And now we're just going to yield x times y times z. They're all dereferenced. Now, looks a bit odd. I'll agree with that. A lot of people, a lot of people go immediately to monad transformers because they don't like the look of a 4 inside of a 4. If that's not cutting your leg off to, or cutting your nose off to spite your face, I don't know what is. Another way to do it, and I like this solution, is just split them up. If it's looking too complicated, deal with the futures and deal with the options separately. Just write some separate methods. OK, one minute. I'm not going to get to the very last one. Uh, you'll have to see that another time. But the point is, there are ways of splitting this up. And I think you demonstrate a better understanding of the domain space if you do this as well. Anybody can follow the, the instructions on the M site and get something running. But the chances are you're not going to understand what you really did, just did there. It's just going to work. You write something like this, and you're really working on the code. You're understanding what you're doing. So the last part, which I'm not going to get to, so it'll have to be a teaser for another time. You'll have to come and see this talk when I've got a little bit longer, is 
the, the key thing about for is that it uses, it turns things into map, flat map, for each with filter, okay? And so far, all of the examples that we've given have, or that I've given, have been very well behaved. They follow the type signatures that you are supposed to follow for monadic behavior. Scala doesn't care if you do that. You can actually change up the types if you know what you're doing. Now, it leads to some pretty hairy code, but you can, there's an example, uh, and Josh has it out on his site, uh, where we deliberately, our time, we deliberately reverse that, turn, the, uh, turn a sync into a co-monad, and still use it in the for expression by changing up the fact that flat maps uh, function that it takes in returns a different type than the result of the flat map operation. You can do that because it's name based. It's not actually following a type in Scala. It's pretty advanced use to do that. And uh, I suggest you have a look at the code. You won't understand it. Uh, you won't understand it until you write that code for yourself. So if you're really interested, I encourage that. Go and have a look at Josh's code sit down and write it for yourself and you will gain the, the understanding of what it means to use for in that way. And that's all I have time for, I'm afraid. It's a little bit rushed, but uh, hopefully something in there was something you didn't know about for. So thank you. <laughs>